Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's TIPS webinar. We'll kick things off with a handful of end-of-year updates and spend the majority of the hour in an open Q&A so you can ask the architect your toughest Citrix questions. My name is Sarah Queen, Senior Manager within our Professional Services team here at Citrix. Today I'm joined by a team of our All-Star Citrix Consulting Architects, including Nick Rintalen, Sarah Steinhoff, Ryan McClure, and Kevin Nardone. Before we get into the presentation, let me quickly review a few housekeeping details. We'll have a live Q&A session toward the end of today's event, and you're welcome to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Simply type your question into the Ask a Question window and click Submit. Also, we're recording this event, and the on-demand version will be available from the same link that you used to join today. So feel free to come back, watch the archive, or share it with your colleagues. And finally, the slides are available for download from the Event Resources tab located along the top of the interface. All right, without further delay, let me go ahead and hand it over to Nick to get us started. Nick? Thanks, Sarah. My name is Nick Rintalen, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm our Principal Architect in CCS, and I also manage the architecture team in the Americas these days. I've been with Citrix almost 15 years now, and one of the things I've probably been asked the most in my career is, you know, where can I find the latest best practices? or you know, where can I stay up to date on Citrix leading practices? So a little over a year ago, we started this technology and practice webinar series. And our primary goal was to address just that. You know, let's take an hour out of each month to share some of the latest best practices with the community. And we want to make sure the content is technical and that our top you know, CCS architects, like the folks we have on today that Sarah just mentioned, are the ones that are actually sharing the lessons learned from the field. Anyway, hopefully this isn't your first TIPS webinar and, and you've already subscribed to the series. And if you're new to TIPS or still playing catch up, on the screen you'll find a list of all our events this year. And you can go to, to bit.ly slash Citrix Tips or YouTube to watch any of these on demand. Anyway, flipping back to the agenda slide here, today we have a special event as we head into the holiday season. We're going to provide some critical end of the year updates related to our most popular topics, and we're going to have a little fun. So I've assembled an all-star panel of CCS Enterprise Architects, and we're going to attempt to answer any questions you have live. It can be something related to you know, a past TIPS event um, or topic, or it can simply be a question that you've been you know, racking your brain and, and you'd like to have you know, Citrix Consulting weigh in on. I'll moderate and, and divvy up the questions to the, the panel at, at the end as they come in. So you might be asking yourself, who's on the star-studded panel? Sarah kind of briefly you know, mentioned them, but let me, let me introduce them and provide a little background. So first, Sarah Steinhoff. Sarah's our lead enterprise architect in the East US. She's an expert on storefront, receiver, and FAS, to name just a few. Um, but she also has a ton of large-scale design experience, since she routinely advises some of our largest customers in the world. And then there's Ryan McClure. Ryan's our lead enterprise architect in the Central. He's one of our security gurus now, um, and he probably knows endpoint management better than anyone. Um, Ryan also has a lot of big customers in his patch, so I dare you to try to stump him with a, a design or scalability question. Um, and then there's Kevin Nardone. Kevin's uh, joint webinars with, with Jeff Mitchell from Microsoft were probably our most popular events this year. And, and Kevin, by the way, is a senior enterprise architect and covers the South Central for us. And he's one of our best Citrus, you know, Citrus Cloud and Azure resources in the entire company, if you ask me. And then there's me. I still pretend to know a few things about <laughs> scalability, profiles, and PVS, to name a few. Um, but I'll go on record right now saying I'll, I'm, I'm most likely to be stumped um, at the end for sure. Um, so I mentioned we'll be providing a few technical updates um, before we launch into the live Q&A or Stump the Architect segment. So what's on tap there? Well, Ryan's going to kick things off and provide an update on how the, the recent Microsoft FS Logix acquisition will impact our Office or Microsoft 365 integration. And then Sarah's going to dive into some of the Access Architecture options that we're seeing deployed with Citrus Cloud. We're getting a lot of questions about that. Um, Kevin's going to provide an update on the latest virtual apps and desktops, Azure scalability numbers and cost models. Um, always a hot topic right now as, as, as more and more folks are moving to the cloud. And then I'll bring it home with an update on how all the recent security vulnerabilities are impacting single server scalability. Um, we're, we're only going to spend about 20 minutes total or, or so on these items, and then we'll launch into that live Q&A so we have plenty of time for questions. All right, Ryan, you're up first. So I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Nick. So just as a, a quick recap of what we discussed back in August when we covered the um, Office 365 and Citrix integration topic, there are really two 
primary challenges that we're trying to deal with here. The first one is uh, the Outlook experience, particularly with non-persistent workloads, and then also the OneDrive for Business experience with uh, non-persistent workloads, which are very common in a Citrix environment. Um, there are also some lesser known challenges with things like the Skype for Business global address list and um, the OneNote local cache, but these were really kind of the, the two main ones that we were focused on because almost everyone or almost all of our customers end up hitting them at some point. So to recap on the Outlook side, um, when we go with uh, an, a hosted exchange solution, that really means we need to be in cached exchange mode from a performance perspective, which means we need to deal with the user's OST somehow. And then we also need to figure out a way to provide users with that native quality search experience if they're using the, the native Outlook client. And with that being a machine-based cache, there wasn't really a, a Windows native way to do that. The other side of things is on or with OneDrive, again, a similar set of considerations. So how do we deal with on-demand sync for server OS where there's no on-demand sync tool? How do we provide a consistent user experience across OS platforms? So if you have users that both need to access a desktop OS model and a server-based computing model. And then also we had customers struggling with how to regulate users from marking files offline in an elegant or manageable fashion. So you may remember this sort of color-coded table we put together as a little bit of a cheat sheet highlighting the, the strengths and some of the trade-offs you were making with each solution and you know, that we were driving customers towards that UPM native search experience capability if the, the prerequisites required. So being on uh, the supported version of Windows 10 or Server 2016 with a, a compatible search index version, if that was an option for you, we were really gravitating that way, but you'll notice there's something conspicuously missing from this table. And that's really the, uh, the FS Logics acquisition that Microsoft made recently. So in mid-November, Microsoft went and acquired FS Logics. If you're not familiar, FS Logics is also a, a VHD-based approach to um, dealing with a, a number of elements of the user workspace. But really the piece that we're focused on in this segment is their Office 365 layer. So similar to the Citrix solution, it addresses the OST and also the search index uh, cache, which enables that real-time search experience. But in terms of additional capabilities, it also has uh, the ability to handle the OneDrive for Business cache, the Skype for Business global address uh, list piece, and also the, the OneNote native cache. So some additional features and capabilities there. So because this is a newer uh, acquisition, the integration details from Microsoft are still being finalized and, and worked out. But the, the question we're getting in the field a lot now is, does this change Citrix's position or recommendation? So because it's a recent acquisition, it's a little early on in the process to jump headlong into FS Logics and say this is the only way to approach Office 365 for you know, Windows 10, Server 2016 in a, a non-persistent computing world. I don't think we've gone that far or made that leap until we see how th some of these things materialize over the, the course of um, the next few months or the, the first half of 2019. But if it's not something that was already on your radar as you were evaluating options to provide this experience to your user community, it's definitely something you should be looking at here uh, heading into 2019 to add to your list of solutions or options to evaluate. So I'll go ahead and uh, hand it off from here to Kevin, who's going to cover some updates for Citrix on Azure. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. And I'm kind of covering when it comes to you know, lessons learned around design, um, deployment process and prerequisites, as well as operations. Really, the, the core goal of 2018, and especially just looking into 2019, is understanding the foundation of Azure principles is key to Citrix success. We've seen time and time again in projects this year where our teams and Citrix teams, as well as um, you know, cloud teams, all have to kind of work together on a customer project to really drive success and, and adoption of uh, 
our technologies to meet a customer's business goals. So kind of understanding at a high level, just some of these concepts, you have operations, you know, how is my environment, go, how are we going to change operations for Citrix on Azure? Um, how does it impact our provisioning technology? How does it impact our, you know, sizing and, and things along those lines and uh, scalability is something we'll get into in a couple minutes. Identity, who are my end users for cloud? Um, what are some of the implications when I go into hybrid cloud and start leveraging, you know, a public cloud workload with my Citrix technologies. Governance, um, I've time and time again, understanding you know, the scalability impact on the financial modeling and the governance of your cloud subscription is a, a key foundational item um, as you kind of get into any sort of Citrix on Azure planning or expansion that you may be facing in 2019 and something your team will really want to understand uh, to kind of set up, that, set up that success and really kind of it's impacted by scalability, how many users you're going to have in your environment, what are the, the, the instant sizing uh, that you'll leverage, uh, how is that being managed from a subscription standpoint. Um, knowing those principles is definitely key towards uh, your success as you look towards 2019. Uh, from a security perspective, uh, the rollout of application security groups, network security groups, um, Azure Security Center, there's been a lot of enhancements um, in Azure tools that can kind of add another uh, set of tools in your tool belt to secure your Citrix environment, as well as understanding the connectivity implications. Uh, well, how are you going to connect your data center um, to Azure? What, how are you going to arrange your workloads and set up things like NetScale or Optimal Gateway routing to kind of direct connections in a way, especially if you're in a hybrid deployment um, that best fits your use cases. So kind of going into 2019, a lot of the same foundational items that we understand uh, as a, a Citrix organization, as well as in our collaboration with Microsoft, is critical to success as you look towards you know, new Azure use cases or uh, maybe approaching Azure for the first time as you look in 2019. Uh, understanding the, the core concepts of Azure, especially around some of these key principles and just kind of key um, architecture strategies is just definitely critical towards success. And one of the biggest ones um, as we, that we kind of really pulled from 2018 is, is new scalability. And this kind of really, a new scalability information, and this really kind of ties into some of the governance um, considerations that you may see around Azure subscriptions, around Azure pricing models uh, that you, you'll, you may approach, you know, and may look towards uh, any projects that you have in 2019. Uh, when it came to scalability, what we were, our, our core focus on was to get you know, the latest single server scalability testing for like published apps and, and hosted desktops on some of the latest Azure instance types, specifically the D series version three, which is general purpose, as well as the F series version two, which is compute optimized. Uh, we chose these two instance types primarily because in most Citrix circumstances, we were seeing these as the most common instances in the field, as well as from a compute perspective, uh, compute tends to be the bottleneck um, for most Citrix customers when it comes to you know, running virtual application workloads. So we wanted to kind of test the uh, compute optimized instances to see how they compared uh, to some of the general purpose instances that we commonly see in the field. Uh, we ran a uh, login VSI testing um, for the task and knowledge worker profiles on a uh, server 2016 VMs uh, with the latest VDA at the time of the testing. And what we saw from, from these results, a couple key takeaways. Uh, we found that from a cost optimization perspective when it comes to you know a uh, dollar per user per hour how many users can i get running in a in a server within that login vsi max and how much does that cost me on a given hour based on the instance what we saw is that the f series instances performed uh, better when it came to price optimization so for from a you know citrix perspective especially if you are going into an azure project where you don't have the luxury of doing initial scalability testing, and you, but you know that your workloads tend to be CPU bound, leading with those F-series instances is a good place to start uh, when it comes to just you know, getting started and, and dipping your toes in Citrix on Azure. Now, just because F-series was compute, you know, had better scale of cost metrics, that doesn't mean D-series is invaluable. So taking the time, if uh, you understand at least the core bottleneck of your, uh, your use case, and if memory is that bottleneck, Shifting to D-series, where you end up spending a little bit more, you get double the memory really for your dollar, um, is a viable option to kind of leverage and, and access and provide an instance for that use case, especially since they need more memory. But one thing that we saw that was consistent between both instance types was scaling up drove better dollar per user per hour metrics. Um, where this does kind of get into that always debate of, you know, should we do pay as you go versus reserved instances? You know, maybe I, I can drain my instances faster if they're smaller. 
uh, what we saw is, you know, by scaling up, you get better metrics. And when it comes to your business planning, when it comes to should I reserve instances versus going pay as you go, uh, we see that most instances, especially if you're running in that like 17 hour, 20 hour per day of just uptime, it tends to actually be more beneficial to reserve those, those instances instead of do pay as you go. Now, one of the things I highlighted here was, you know, you might not have the luxury to do scalability testing, so you can lead with these instances, because the great thing about Azure is, is you can change. You can adjust as needed uh, based on your workloads. Um, definitely, res it's, it's worth, you know, the way you can start with a certain instance size out of the gate, it's better to get some data and some utilization uh, and better understanding of how they're going to perform with your use case before you reserve, since that is something that does need to be paid upfront for a year or three years of consumption. So optimize where possible, and you can always adjust as needed based on your workloads, and then look towards you know, gathering internal data and seeing how your use case runs in Azure before you look towards reserving instances. Um, that's all you know, I have in terms of updates for 2018, and look forward to some of your questions. I'll now uh, pass it off to Sarah Steinhoff uh, to, just to go over Access Architecture with Citrix Cloud. Thanks. So, yep, I'm going to be spending the next couple of minutes talking through um, what changes we've had in our access architecture with Citrix Cloud. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently at some of my customers when they're moving to the Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service as to what do they do with their access components, um, namely gateway and, and storefront, because we have options, right? So with, with options come more choices and more decisions that have to be made. So firstly, we'll be starting with workspace versus kind of traditionally customer managed or on-prem storefront. So do we use workspace, do we not use workspace? Um, and the first consideration that we really talk about is authentication. So workspace today has a much more limited set of authentication options than what's available with traditional customer owned or managed Citrix gateway and storefront, um, which is usually kind of that first determining factor in whether it's even an option on the table or not. Workspace does support MFA, which is kind of a common misconception, and a lot of folks think that it's single factor only. Um, but it's primarily with Azure MFA today, with OTP kind of coming very sooner in tech preview. So if you are standardized on Radius provider like Symantec or RSA, then you will have to use your traditional Citrix gateway and storefront um, for authentication to support those more advanced or alternate um, multi-factor authentication providers. So that means you're still managing a gateway and storefront server, even if it's ultimately connecting back into Citrix Cloud for your virtual apps and desktop service. If Azure MSA does meet your needs, um, that's traditional SAML-based authentication provider, and anyone familiar with SAML authentication back from on-prem days with 6.5 or 7x knows that we've typically had challenges with single sign-on back to our VDAs since Windows operating systems don't support SAML single sign-on as an authentication method. So that all changed when we introduced federated authentication service back in um, Synapse and Desktop 7.9. Caveat is that specifically with Workspace, SAS integrates directly with Storefront and the VDAs. So that integration link is missing today with Workspace. So until that integration comes, if you configure Azure MFA, meaning SAML, with the Workspace service, your users are just going to be prompted a second time to enter their credentials once they launch their application or desktop session to the VDA. If that second credential prompt is not something that you think will be acceptable to your users, again, we fall back to customer owned and operated such as Gateway and Storefront. You can hook those in um, with Azure MFA, add in your federated authentication service, and you get your single sign on back to your VDA. Um, last but not least, if Azure MSA does work for you and you are okay with the second credential prompt, um, note that Workspace does not yet have a concept of contextual-based awareness to present different authentication options depending on who the user is or, or where they are. So even though Workspace itself supports both single-factor and multi-factor authentication methods, you're picking one for all of your users. So most of my customers today kind of have an underlying assumption that we'll be able to present different methods depending on like internal users getting a single factor or pass through and like your external users, um, only they would be prompted for multi-factor authentication. So again, that just necessitates your uh, traditional Citrix gateway and storefront to have that contextual awareness of, hey, this user is on my network, 
Um, therefore, I'm not going to prompt them at all. I'm just going to do domain pass through. I'm going to do a single factor or this user's outside. I'm going to do a combination of factors of authentication. Once you get past the authentication scenarios, there are some other kind of smaller considerations around customization that tend to come up. Um, so as you can see from that screenshot on the right, um, you do not get a full storefront console with Citrix Cloud. So naturally, there's going to be more limited branding and multi-store customization available. Um, then if you had your own storefront server where you have full access to IIS to do what you want to as many web pages as you want. Um, so there are still branding options. It's just you're not getting that access to IIS to have multiple stores based on different scenarios um, or really get into more advanced branding and customization features of a web page like adding buttons or scripts or things like that. Last but not least, I get a lot of questions about integration of legacy environments. So in short, does using workspace mean you have to also be fully migrated to the Citrix virtual apps and desktop service? And the answer is no. Uh, workspace supports aggregation of legacy kind of customer managed environments and vice versa. Storefront also supports aggregation of Citrix virtual apps and desktop services site. So using workspace in the cloud doesn't mean that you also have to be using a virtual apps and desktops site in the cloud, you can have a combination, and same thing with storefront. Using on-prem storefront doesn't preclude you from consuming the Citrix virtual and apps and desktop service. So that's kind of it for, for storefront. So hopping back over to the gateway, um, the related component to what you do with storefront is what do you do with Citrix gateway? So there is a gateway service that's available within Citrix cloud that serves as an ICA proxy um, that's really user location based. So there's multiple global points of presence and GSLB to kind of automatically direct you to the closest gateway to where you physically are. If most of your VDAs are still on-prem or in some other location that may not be close to you, you may also decide that you want to route ICA sessions through an on-prem Citrix gateway that you already have deployed, uh, which you can also specify based on VDA resource location within the workspace configuration, or of course with traditional kind of on-prem storefront via optimal gateway routing. So we do have a lot of options about how we proxy ICA connections through gateway, both with workspace and with storefront. If you are using the hosted gateway service, there's been a lot of talk about the scalability of cloud connectors. Since all communication with Citrix Cloud, including the gateway service, is proxied through cloud connectors, um, which tend to become a bottleneck when it comes to ICA traffic. So as a result, we've developed a new rendezvous protocol that allows VDAs with direct internet access to bypass those cloud connectors and route directly to the gateway service. So in general, there's been a lot of recent development work focused around trying to free up those cloud connectors and make those services more scalable. Lastly, for my customers who have determined that workspace and gateway services do meet their needs, having kind of worked through all these previous considerations, there's usually one final question about whether they can get rid of their existing storefront and or Citrix ADC instances, um, which usually prompts the conversation about what other functions may be configured on that ADC appliance. So just like you don't get a full storefront console with the workspace service, you don't get a full NetScaler console with the gateway service. It is ICA proxy only. So if you're using ADC for low balancing of either Citrix or non-Citrix components, you'll likely still need a Citrix ADC instance either on-prem or in whatever public cloud provider you're deployed in for those non-gateway functions, um, which we just don't want to forget about in the kind of early planning and, and costing phases of a project. That's really all I have for access architecture updates. So I'm going to send it back to Nick to talk through uh, new security considerations and Citrix scalability. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, we did two TIPS webinars on some of the security vulnerabilities that surfaced this year. Um, specifically, we did an event early in the year after Meltdown Inspector were released or introduced. And we did another event after L1 Terminal Fault was unveiled to the public and we had a chance to do some testing. So I thought it would be timely to talk about how all these newish security vulnerabilities impact single-server scalability, because we've been getting a lot of questions around which variants impact you know, single-server scalability the most, how all of them combined might change the rule of 5 and 10, et cetera. So b before I get there, I wanted to quickly review the rule of 5 and 10. It, this is something I came up with a couple years back to allow folks to quickly estimate density for you know, virtual apps and, and desktops workloads, or Zenepins and desktop. And the math is, is pretty simple. Simply, let me build this out here. Simply take the, you know, the, simply take the number of physical cores in the box 
and either and then you know, multiply it by the the correct magic multiplier. So that's that's five for virtual desktops and and ten for virtual apps. Of course, your mileage will vary, but it, it's also amazing how accurate this is. And, and I'll show you some proof in a minute. Um, if this rule or this math is new to you, I'd recommend checking out the new TechZone article um, I wrote on this topic last month. The link's right there at the bottom. Um, it's basically an updated version of the blog I authored about 18 months ago or so. So now the, the, the million dollar question, how do all these security vulnerabilities impact you know, single server scalability or, or change this rule of, of 5 and 10? Citrix and other vendors and partners have done rounds and rounds of testing now on all these variants, um, both combined and in isolated fashion to understand what, what hampers performance the most. And without question, <clears throat> it's, you know, Spectre and L1 terminal fault you know, definitely hit us the hardest. And on the flip side, Meltdown and Bypass were you know, fairly insignificant or minimal, I'll say, when it comes to Triple S. And to be clear, there are more than this, but I'm just providing a, a couple popular examples. And every variant is different. Um, just because Meltdown and Spectre came out around the same time doesn't mean they're anything alike or the risks are the, you know, the same or the mitigations are even similar. The, you know, each of these are different animals and each vulnerability and variant on top of it should be evaluated individually by security teams and key business leaders. Anyway, back on topic, I, I find that ranges and examples always help. So I provided a, a best and worst case scenario here um, that we've seen in the field firsthand, so not in a lab to be clear. And you can also see one popular deployment scenario there with the latest you know, Zenapp LTSR on ESXi. We're routinely seeing about a 30% hit or so um, to performance or single server scalability. And with that in mind, the last thing I wanted to tackle or address was how these mitigations might change the rule of 5 and 10. And I'll focus on virtual apps or, or Zenapp for a minute because it's the most popular use case still today, and we also have the most data. Um, so I looked at seven real-world deployments we did in, in 2018, and I kind of just averaged all the results. And, um, you know, so how close did we get to that magic multiplier of, of 10 for, for virtual apps? Well, 9.83. So pretty darn close. But, you know, you might be asking, and I really wondered this myself, like, how, how can this be explained? Well, for one, and you may have noticed this on the last slide, we found that only about half of the customers have applied all the mitigations to date. So that right there is probably keeping the number artificially high. And I'm not going to go on record saying that this is the right approach or you shouldn't patch. I'm just pointing out it was a very interesting finding as we looked at these real-world deployments in the enterprise space in particular. The other reasons why we believe this number is hanging around 10 is, is simply because prior to 2018, the magic multiplier had actually crept up to about 12 or 13 is what we were seeing. And this was due to advances in Intel processors, I think was the biggest reason, but also hypervisor CPU scheduler improvements, um, the increased use of Citrix Optimizer is getting better and better, and even technologies like WEM. Um, so if you factor in you know, that 30% hit I just kind of mentioned, that 12 or 13 you know, a number a year ago might actually be more like 9 or 10, as you see here today. Anyway, that's, you know, if you have any questions about this, I'm definitely happy to take some. And on that note, Let's jump into the live Q&A or Stump the Architect segment. Sarah, did you want to say anything before we get going here? Yep, just a quick reminder um, on how you can submit those questions. So go ahead and um, drop them into the Ask a Question area on your screen. Simply type your question into the box and hit Submit. So it looks like we've got quite a full queue today, so I'll go ahead and hand it back over to you guys to get started and encourage all of you to check out the Citrix blog. I'm sure we'll post um, something post-event to summarize you know, our FAQs from today, as I assume we won't get through the whole list. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. So let's dive right in. Looks like the first question here is about workspace. So. Because isn't workspace just storefront in the cloud? Why are the feature sets so different? Sarah, do you want to grab that one? Sure. So I think that's a, a very tempting misconception because a lot of folks that are familiar with our core virtual apps and desktop service, you log in, you see Studio. So you kind of assume there's a delivery controller running in the background, and then the same thing for a storefront and Netscaler. Surely there's a storefront server just running in the background. Why can't we just expose that console? Why are the feature sets so different? Um, and it's actually because it truly is a different product. We have re-architected storefront in our cloud service because it's no longer just about virtual apps and desktops. We've added in feeds for other things like SaaS applications and files. So it truly is a new and different product. 
Um, and that's why you'll see such large deltas between the feature sets between on-prem and so just cloud. So if we think of workspace service as a net new product, just like when Storefront was first released versus web interface, there was that kind of large feature gap. The same thing is happening with workspace. And, and with time, obviously, we'll be adding more and more to that service. So it'll start to look more like the features that we have in the on-prem version. Perfect. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. Here's one for Kevin. Um, I need to justify a dedicated Citrix subscription to my cloud team internally. Can you help? <laughs> Perfect, thanks, Nick. Um, and just for clarity for everyone, when we say subscription here, we're probably talking about an Azure subscription. And um, when it comes to dedicating an Azure subscription towards Citrix, uh, one of the biggest considerations here is the subscription limits that Microsoft has on their subscriptions. Subscription limits come with default limits. It con controls the amount of CPU cores, managed disks, et cetera, and these can be scaled to a maximum. Um, another piece that's limited for Azure subscriptions is also API reads and writes. Uh, Microsoft Azure um, Resource Manager is based off of a REST API, and every action you actually make in the console is a read or write against that API, and they cap that from a load throttling standpoint at the subscription. So from a Citrix perspective, having a dedicated subscription towards Citrix, it allows you to kind of maximize the scale that you can get out of that subscription without creating a resource contention with other departments. For example, if you wanted to, say, spin up uh, you know, 500 desktops for you know, a net new use case, you don't want to create a scenario where the provisioning task fails due to um, you know, another team going through a similar operation at the same time. This also gets into, again, with like the reads and writes, you know, needing to do you know, a, boot, uh, a boot storm to kind of meet demand during the day. If you were kind of running that activity, it'll hit the writes on that subscription, and then you could potentially load throttle another department. So it's definitely something worth considering, especially if you're going to deploy Citrix at scale, and there really is no added cost for having a subscription, and will give you more control in terms of rights management and things along those lines outside of just some scalability considerations. Okay, yep, thanks, Kevin. Um, here's a really good question, because I, I know a lot of us have, have been actually trying to answer this question and working with Microsoft on it, but. The question is, you mentioned options for handling Office 365 data, but what are customers doing to make this data highly available in a public cloud? Ryan, do you want to <clears throat> take a stab at that one? Anybody, anybody else can feel free to chime in too. Yeah, sure, I can take that one, Nick. So uh, there are a couple of options, and I think when I have this discussion with customers, everyone wants to kind of lean towards the, the PaaS or platform as a service option as the ideal solution. But right now there's some gaps in terms of uh, NTFS support with most of those solutions today. So we haven't really gotten customers too far down that path because of that kind of critical feature gap. Um, there are uh, platform services being worked on on both the, the Microsoft and AWS side that may become um, available for consideration in the future, but nothing definitive really as of yet that we've seen in the field. So it really leaves us with um, kind of three options. We can look at uh, storage spaces direct and scale out file services. We can look at DFSR, and we can look at uh, some of the third-party appliances that are, that are out there like uh, NetApp. So I would say that we're probably seeing uh, S2D and DFSR implemented more often than third-party appliances just yet due to uh, more often than not cost considerations and just customer comfort. Uh, when we're talking about DFSR, if you're deeply familiar with DFSR and have worked with it and tuned it before, it can certainly be a, a viable solution. It can just be one of those situations where um, occasionally you have to deal with some file locking challenges, particularly with things like Outlook OSTs that can be uh, particularly problematic. And then on the S2D side, there is a, a performance impact. So for things like user logon, you're going to see a, a slight increase. Um, so it, it's really a matter of weighing those pros and cons against the priorities of your environment and really your comfort administering the two solutions to figure out which is best for you. So not a definitive yes or no, definitely go with this type answer, but those are kind of the options we see customers exploring most in the field. And I would say DFSR and S2D are probably split fairly down the middle at this point, maybe leaning slightly towards S2D at this point. Okay, thanks Ryan. Here's a question calling myself out. So Nick mentioned advancements in Intel processors. Is there anything in particular that you can talk about that impacts scalability or sizing? 
Yeah, so <clears throat> besides the fact that Intel's shipping 28 core processors now, which is kind of hard to believe, Intel also changed the way they design and construct the underlying chip and memory architecture. So let me, let me explain that piece a bit. On older chips like Broadwell and Haswell, Intel connected processors using a ring-based architecture. But as the number of cores increased, you know, access latency increased and bandwidth per core actually diminished. So Intel would mitigate this by essentially splitting the chip into two halves and adding a second ring to reduce the distances. And this, you know, I called it invisible split, um, was something that needed to be factored in when we did, you know, ZenApp and Zen Desktop sizing to provide optimal results. And in the, we've kind of referred to this in the past as NUMA, <clears throat> or non-uniform memory access, and the leading guidance was to ensure that you're sizing ZenApp VMs as large as possible, but not crossing that, you know, NUMA nodes or sub-NUMA clusters or rings at the same time. So if you size your ZenApp VMs too large and they, they effectively span NUMA nodes, it could lead to NUMA thrashing by accessing those non-local resources. And that would, of course, you know, re yield reduced single server scalability. But fast forward to today, and Intel's moved from a ring-based architecture to a mesh-based architecture. And this new mesh architecture introduced in Skylake, it doesn't have the same limitations as before where we have to split chips or divide cores or add rings. And that, this changes the way we size ZenApp servers in particular. So it's, it's really important to understand that, you know, underlying what, what specific chips being used and if, you're, if it's ring or mesh underneath. Um, an example might help here. So if you run into a 20-core chip like I did, you know, just two weeks ago at a customer, it's not necessarily split into two NUMA nodes anymore with 10 cores each. Um, and 10 vCPUs m might not be the way to go. At this particular customer, we ended up deploying a 16 vCPU config on a new 20-core gold chip with this mesh-based architecture, and the performance was outstanding. So it just goes to show you that what was a best practice, you know, even a year ago, you know, might not be the uh, best practice today. Um, another next question here, what's the tipping point where it makes sense to go from on-demand to reserved instances? Does the type of workload, like server or desktop OS, really matter? Ryan, you want to take that one? Yeah, sure, Nick, I can take that one. So th this one comes up a lot, and I think, um, customers really gravitate towards that kind of smart scale model of spinning machines up and down on demand in uh, a public cloud of their choosing. And when we've done the math, I, I think we were even surprised a little bit the way that it works out. So, you know, first, does the workload matter? I, I would say it does only insofar as you have to consider how users are interacting with these resources. So if it's something like a dedicated desktop, in a lot of environments that we work in, you can't just set the expectation that, hey, your, your desktop is going to become available at 8 p.m. and at 5 p.m. I'm going to shut it down on you and it's not going to be available overnight. You know, it could be developers running jobs on the machine that need to stay up and running, maybe users that expect to be able to access that machine anytime, day or night, um, and don't necessarily want to have to wait for it to boot up. So I would say dedicated desktops are a scenario where often they have to be up and running so frequently that doing on demand doesn't end up making a ton of sense. Same thing with infrastructure. For the most part, all of our infrastructure is going to be online pretty much all the time. So as long as we know the environment's going to be around for you know a, a year or three years, it starts to make uh, sense to look at those one year or three year reserved instance models from a costing perspective. Where it gets a little trickier is when you start to look at non-persistent desktops and server OS workloads. So at a very high level, what we've seen is if the machine can be up for less than right around 16 hours, um, that's where you start to see gains by going with um, the smart scale type model where you're only bringing it up on demand. If it's got to be up for more than 16 hours, you're going to end up seeing that the reserved instances end up being cheaper anyway. Um, I, all of that said, there are a couple of key variables to make sure to do some math on your own to make sure you get the same result. Uh, the licensing model and whether it's BYOL or you're consuming the, uh, the OS license as part of the instance type makes a big difference. And then also things like the instance type itself, any specific discounting you may get from Microsoft, uh, those things also play a role. So be sure to do the math, but right around that um, 16 hour tipping point ends up being what we see most often when we do the, the calculations out. Great, thanks Ryan. Next question, if I'm deploying my own Netscaler gateway or storefront with Citrus Cloud virtual apps and desktop service, where should I place them? Are there any advantages to putting them in Azure close to the Citrus Cloud services? Sarah, that looks like it's up your alley. You wanna grab it? Sure, and, and I've gotten a lot of questions in general about placing 
customer managed components in Azure because of the close to Citrix cloud. And, and in general, that shouldn't be a deciding factor only because there's no direct connection or VPN that we're establishing. It's all going to be over the internet talking back to Citrix cloud. So there's really no advantage from a routing perspective to putting anything to Azure because it's, it's quote unquote close to our services. Really want to be following the same rule that we kind of always do for our access components. If you have Netscaler, because it's going to be proxying ICA connections to your VDAs, you generally want that close to your VDAs. You don't want to be hairpinning users, making a connection to a VDA through some other data center or public cloud location um, for, for network routing reasons. So either I would say close to wherever your actual workloads are going to be or close to where your users are going to be is where we want to keep those access components to avoid adding any additional hops they may not need. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Next question, Kevin, you're mentioned in it, so let's see if, uh, there, it looks like there, this might be a stumper. <laughs> Kevin, for power down machines in Azure, our users get the, quote, cannot start desktop, unquote, because the machine registration is taking too long. How do we extend the time you know, the receiver needs to wait for the machine to spin up and become fully registered? Excellent, thanks, Nick. And, and thankfully, uh, I just ran into this at a customer. Um, the area in question that you wanna take a look at, especially if you're doing um, this in a sense where it's like a customer managed controller, is modifying uh, the extra spin up time seconds registry key. Um, this is what the broker uses to set the timeout for session establishment if the target is a power managed VM but not uh, available at the time. Um, if you're a Citrix Cloud customer, this is something that actually we have a handful of customers on Citrix Cloud using Azure, where we actually upped the default for Azure connections from 120 seconds to 240 seconds. And you can actually control, as of um, Cloud Release 64 a couple months back, you can actually control that timeout by setting uh, metadata on that Azure host connection. Say, for example, if the 240 seconds you needed, say, you know, 300 seconds or more. Uh, so that is something that can be modified, even though on the customer managed version of virtual app and desktop, it would be hidden for a Citrix Cloud customer. So that's where you'd want to start. Um, that's going to be the timeout that end users see. And then um, thank you for attending. And I'll actually post a couple of resources on that question um, that you can kind of take a look at in terms of setting that key, as well as modifying the metadata, but always recommend, you know, doing this in a, a test environment prior to implementing in production, but it's something you can take a look at uh, to address that issue. All right. Not stumped yet. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> uh, next question here from Jose. Anyone knows if FS Logics is included for EA customers? Ryan, you want to take a stab at that one? Yeah, sure, I can take that one. I, I think this is one of those things, unless it's changed since late last week, because this stuff is all moving very quickly, where um, Microsoft is still working out the commercial details of exactly how they're going to make this available. I, I think you're thinking down the right general lines, but as far as I'm aware, there's nothing public that we can really share on that yet definitively to say, you know, which customers are going to be entitled on the Microsoft side. Yeah, okay. Next question, we'll, we'll stick with you, Ryan. It's about FS Logics again. Can you dive into the footnote about FS Logics support for multiple sessions? Paul was wondering. Yeah, so there's a, a VHD access mode setting that's kind of buried in there. Um, and there are four options, zero through three. And the default zero, which is basically if you try and launch a concurrent session and the VHD is already in, in use, that additional session launch will fail. But there is an option, um, it, it's mode three, I think, if I remember, um, that is a per session mode. So essentially, it'll use a, a VHDX-based difference disk to deal with uh, multiple user sessions. So the, the behavior is configurable. Uh, that said, obviously, each concurrent session is now creating an additional VHDX, and there's a, a storage impact in terms of both uh, raw storage consumed and also the I.O. profile. So that was why we had it in, in yellow instead of just green. Yup, it can work no problem. Um, but it, it is something that you can adjust. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. A um, little housekeeping because I, I see maybe a few questions um, here about kind of forward-looking stuff. So, like, you know, one of them is asking, like, when is this going to be available? When can we expect this feature in Citrus Cloud? We can't really, you know, speak about those kind of, you know, roadmap type items, but um, we can we can definitely connect offline and 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 set up you know some sort of roadmap discussion with product management um, if you're looking for exact dates or timelines. 
Um, another question here about like, is this going to be recorded? Yes, it's definitely recorded. And, or another question, can we view this on demand? Yep, you can go to bit.ly slash Citrix tips. Um, and, and, and you can view all these online there anytime, or they're actually going to be on YouTube as well. Um, here's one that's kind of forward looking, but I want to, I want to take it just because um, there's two parts. So when would, when would we get application tagging functionality in Citrus Cloud? Um, Sachin was asking. Um, Kevin or Sarah, do you want to take that one? I can, I can take that one. Um, so when it comes to just core uh, tagging functionality, some of that is available uh, within Citrus Cloud today in terms of tagging some of your resources and things along those lines. App groups, um, a feature that is available in the on-prem version of the product has not yet made its way into Citrix Cloud. Um, another area, especially with the concept of tagging, is uh, tagging resources within Azure. Um, right now, that is not something that is available within the cloud. However, there are workarounds where you can tag some of your machine catalog resources that you provision with Azure MCS using, using Azure Policy. Uh, Azure Policy is a governance tool that allows you to control Azure resources and kind of apply your governance standards towards the management and allocation of those resources. Uh, one useful way to apply tags to your machine catalogs, even though it's not yet available in Studio, is creating an append policy that'll actually update those resources with a applicable tag. And this actually kind of ties a little bit into some of what Ryan mentioned about reserved instances and the concept of reserved instances. Azure policy also allows you to deny specific instance types from being provisioned within your subscription. So for example, if your organization were to reserve F-series instances for your Zen app machines, you know, you don't want your administrators provisioning like N-series or D-series instances. And you can actually use Azure policy to restrict um, to a specific set of SKUs. So you can actually use that policy mechanism to restrict what you want to deploy to that specific set of instance types as well as append and apply tags to those instances, even though it's not something yet available within Studio, um, to then you say use those tags for say, you know, chargeback or resource tracking. Um, so while you know tagging, it's, it's an evolving uh, concept, especially when it comes to getting some of the parity with uh, on-prem products and things like app groups, uh, there are still ways to address tagging using you know, cloud native tools if you're delivering your workloads within, within Azure using Citrix Cloud. Yeah, and just and quick add-on about app groups real quick, um, because that's one that we've gotten a lot of questions about in Citrix Cloud. And although we don't have app groups yet, you can publish an app across multiple delivery groups natively. So sometimes that's gotten around the end functionality that some of my customers have been looking for, even without an application group. You can still publish an app in like priority order across multiple delivery groups. Perfect. Thanks, Kevin and Sarah. Um, next question. I had an issue getting EMS working with Azure ADDS on MDM mode, even with Citrix support. H have any of you got this working? Is it supported? Umar was asking that. Ryan, do you want to try to tackle that one? Yeah, so I haven't done a, a ton of work on the Azure AD front with uh, endpoint management, but we do support uh, Azure AD integration for things like MDM enrollment and our RBAC user roles and that sort of thing. You need to use um, user certificates for the, the MAM piece of things, but it's not totally clear from your question if you're talking ADDS or Azure AD proper. So um, without some more details, I, I can't speak definitively to your situation, but there is documentation out there on it in um, Azure AD integration for those specific features that I mentioned uh, is something that we support. So um, if we haven't gotten it working so far, I would say let's you know stick with the the case that's open and see if we can figure out the uh, the configuration error that's causing us a problem. All right, thanks, Ryan. Joseph was asking, what's the Citrus recommendation for user profiles when planning for a DR site? You know, active passive model. Can we use storage spaces direct for user profiles? And before maybe Sarah, you tackle that one, another kind of question or maybe a statement came in saying, um, James was saying that storage replica with 2016 looks to be better than DFSR. I haven't fully vetted it yet, but do you want to talk about maybe about that? You know, our, this is always a, a really good design question around, you know, profiles and active, 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 passive, active DR. Sure. So there's, we've, gone, I think, around a lot with what our, our general kind of HR and then DR options in um, both Azure and AWS are, because they're a lot different than on-prem, right? So that the kind of two leaders initially were DFS and DFSR, and then um, scale-out file servers, and kind of 
the balancing act that we had to play was that one was more good for smaller files, being DFS, and then scale file servers was originally designed specifically for large files, like those VHDXs that Ryan was talking about earlier with FS logics would be good, or for your OST files. But there wasn't one that kind of handled both a lot of small files as well as fewer large files well. Um, so we believe that storage space is direct with scale file servers. That kind of combination may be better to address both of those workloads, but I still have a lot of customers testing those. I had some customers have started down the path of scale off file servers um, for OSTs and then ended up deploying DFS for their profiles because they had issues when they had those lots of small files. Um, I think specifically in Azure, storage replica is a good option for an active passive model. Um, some storage providers like NetApp have also started introducing their own appliances into the Azure marketplace specifically that may add more options there. I think we've all been burned a little bit in our own way with DFS on-prem um, at very, very large environments with many, many, many profiles at scale. So I think there's a lot of hesitance in general to depend on that in, even in a, in a public cloud. Um, so I think we have a lot of folks that may have started with that, um, but then are starting to move forward with testing with either storage replica or scale file service with storage space direct as they kind of grow the implementation and have to account for more types of file services. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, next one here is the HDX optimization pack on track to support Microsoft Teams in the near future. Yeah, so, so for that one, Kathy, um, we, we do have a couple resources. We've kind of publicly made our stance on that one. Um, the two thing, the two resources, if you, if you just Google Citrix blogs, you'll see a couple, and then Microsoft Teams, you'll see two articles that we kind of talk about our, our you know, forward-looking plans or what we can share publicly. One's from Fernando Kerflon, and the other one's from Derek Thorslin. So you can kind of um, check those out and get some more details on what we're planning. All right, next question here. Um, hi, I've tried running um, oh, MCS IO in Azure on two occasions with no success. It actually has a negative impact on performance. Um, takes longer to register. Has anyone got this running in Azure successfully, or are there known issues around it? Cheers, John. Yeah, John, so this is one we definitely know. Ryan, do you want to grab that one? No, I mean, I think you started to, to cover it, Nick. This is one where there, there is a little bit of a, a known issue here, and we've actually observed similar in uh, our testing. So right now our recommendation is to um, essentially not enable it for the, the time being, and it is known amongst our engineering team and something that we're actively working on. So um, you're not seeing results that are drastically different than what others have seen. So I, I guess there's some reassurance in that, and then it's something that we're actively working on. Thanks, Ryan. Um, next question about sizing and planning. Mattia was asking, are there any particular rule or worst practice if I mix virtual desktops and virtual apps on the same host? <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, that one's always, we, we, I mean, pe I know customers do it in, you know, in, in practice and in reality sometimes when, uh, you know, we're constrained for maybe hardware, but, you know, if, I'm all, if I always have my choice in designing an environment, um, I, I like to have kind of the three cluster approach, you know, um, if you will. So one one cluster for kind of dedicated for infrastructure, another customer, you know, for Zen app workloads, another customer or another cluster for, you know, Zen desktop or virtual desktop workloads. And the reason why is like, if they're all uniform and like, like, like Zen apps were very specific on like the CPU over subscription ratio, where like we like a two to one over subscription ratio. But for VDI, you know, we might be able to get away with four or five or six. And so mixing those two together, it just it really, you know, decreases the predictability of the system. So it's just, it makes it really tough. I mean, if you have really good monitoring tools, sure, you can do it. You can give it a shot. But it's really hard, like, especially on the ZenApp side, where we're really specific on how many VMs we want on each specific host and what over subscription ratio. We just, it just makes it your job a lot harder, I feel like, on the monitoring um, side. So, yeah, that's, you know, I like that three-cluster design approach. Um... Let's see, next question. Um, Jonathan was asking, with Workspace Premium, how can I track utilization at the end user basis? Like, I, for example, you know, ID a bandwidth hog. I don't know, if Kevin, do you want to maybe try that one? or? Sure. Um, 
the, one of the, uh, the I guess the, the primary tools you'd want to be you'd want to have interest in would be uh, HDX Insight um, and setting up uh, setting up HDX Insight with your Netscaler if that's something you're deploying. It's not yet supported with the gateway service from a, a Citrus Cloud perspective, but when it comes to identifying things like bandwidth as well as better information on latency, packet loss, HDX Insight's a great tool to enhance uh, some of the network monitoring that you see within. Uh, virtual app and desktop uh, deployment. I'd say it's something worth looking into. There are uh, scalability considerations um, on your Netscaler. Um, so just you want to keep in mind from a sizing perspective, it does uh, you to leverage more CPU to process that data, but it is something that can, it is a tool that can give you more information on end user network parameters um, if you're if you have bandwidth hosts in your environment. Yeah, okay. and I would just add, um, if you kind of look outside bandwidth and generally how we monitoring things with Citrix Cloud, Director is still your best bet for kind of your Citrix session monitoring load over time, those kinds of things. You can still run all those historical reports. Um, something that had been missing for a while was a way to query that data programmatically or get at, get at it via some way other than logging in through the Citrix Cloud web console. And we now support our data queries. So I have a lot of customers that are kind of retooling some of their scripts to be able to pull that monitoring database data, you know, daily or weekly to, to get at that usage information, like how many users are logging in every day or whether their user has used their provisioned persistent BDI within the month and whether that should be decommissioned. So um, I think we've made great strides on that side in terms of making that data accessible from other systems, um, which can really help with monitoring of the environment at an enterprise level. Great. Thanks, Kevin and Sarah. Um, next question, any recommendations or case studies around persistent VDI DR, either to another DC or Azure? That's from Kevin. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> um, Sarah, do you want to start, start that one off maybe? And then Ryan, I know you also have been doing some, some work there lately with customers, so feel free to chime in. Sure. So I think specifically with Azure, if it's going to on-prem into Azure, which we've had a lot of customers want to do, or from Azure to Azure, um, Azure Site Recovery is really the tool that's recommended by Microsoft. If we look specifically at their public documentations, they're only quoting Windows Server operating systems at this point. So we're, we're in conversations with Microsoft to confirm whether that is um, also supported on Win 10. Uh, I know I've heard from customers, I have Microsoft actually engaged at accounts where they are doing this actively for Win 10 workloads. Um, so it seems like it may be supported, but just the public documentation has not yet been updated. So I definitely would recommend that if you're at a customer that wants to do this, that you engage with their Microsoft rep to confirm support, because it seems like, again, those public documentation needs a little bit of, of updating. As for on-prem to on-prem, it's the same tools that we've had for forever. So if it's VMware, it's VMware Site Recovery Manager tool, um, but really within the Azure space, um, ASR is where we're leaning pretty heavily. I don't know, Ryan, if you see anything different. Yeah, I think the one other one is that we've done the uh, some Azure to Azure work as well, and because of the uh, the supportability clarifications that were um, we were waiting on, we de um, developed a sort of parallel uh, script that essentially created a, a snapshot of the machine and then copied it over to another region, kind of the old-fashioned way, if you will. So that's another option you have at your disposal if you. Um, don't get a, a super clear answer on the ASR front as it can be done with a, a script to essentially snapshot the disk in region one, copy it over to uh, another region, and then build the machine off of that uh, snapshot and copied disk in a, a different region if, if the necessity arises. Perfect. Thanks, Sarah and Ryan. And it looks like that's the end of all the questions. Um, so yeah, I think we got through about 20 questions there. There, there are a couple again uh, that are forward-looking, or someone asking for dates. We can't really provide those. There's one other question we didn't take or answer here live about um, a resource. We can follow up with you directly on that one. Um, someone was looking for like a definitive guide, so we can follow up on the side. Um, but if there's no more questions, uh, I think we're at the top of the hour, so it's perfect. Um, again, if we happen to miss your question, we'll either follow up directly or we'll put together. You know, FAQ, as Sarah mentioned, and, and publish it on Citrix blogs. 
Um, but thanks for tuning in, and we really appreciate your time today. Talk to you later. Bye.